All right. Well, um, hi, Sydney, Sydney, Michigan, and Ontario, Canada. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I would like to do a couple housekeeping items, and I will repeat these housekeeping items at the end. This talk is going to be about 45 minutes long with 15 minutes for question and answer. We are recording this talk and it will be live on the Buzzy Helps website at buzzyhelp slash webinars by Monday of next week. The uh, Needle Fear Friendly Certification Quiz will be sending you an automatic link at the end of the webinar. So when the webinar ends, you should get a Needle Fear Friendly. You will need to be registered to be able to take the certificate and download. There is no charge at this time for the certification. When the webinar goes live again as of next week um, on Monday, there will be a charge for the certification, but it is free for all of you, especially those of you waking up at 4.30 in Adelaide, Australia um, for today. The um, talk is not currently being given for CME. There will likely be a repeat of this webinar for CME at some point in the future through my affiliation with Georgia Regents University, which used to be Medical College of Georgia. So um, to jump in with other nitty gritty, the faculty disclosure, I do have a conflict of interest. I am the inventor of Buzzy, Vibracool, Massaging Ice Therapy, and Distraction Cards. However, there will be balanced and conflict of interest free presentation of research. Most of the discussion of pain items is in the latter half. Most of the beginning half of this talk is going to be about vasovagal symptoms, vasovagal syncope, and needle fear. And then we'll move into addressing needle fear, which will encompass both pain, distraction, and fear. I will not be discussing any unapproved or off-label indications for any of the medications which I am discussing. All of the references are at the bottom of the slides. After the talk, there will be a bibliography, but I will not be distributing copies or handouts of this talk. Um, I will, however, make a reference bibliography available. And finally, images are used with permission and are either my relatives or are people that have given me permission to use this. We have, um, and I'm sorry, a little notice to clarify, at the end of the seminar, you will be automatically redirected to the exam for the Needle Fear Friendly Certification. If you are not redirected for some reason, we will post a link that will take you to the exam. All right. So without further ado, you know, normally when I'm talking, someone does the introduction. And so it's a bit odd on a webinar, but I'm gonna have to introduce myself. So I am Dr. Amy Baxter. I am a pediatric emergency physician. I graduated from Yale University. I did my medical school at Emory and I trained in pediatrics and child abuse at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I then moved to King's Daughters in Virginia for my emergency fellowship practiced in Dallas for two years and practiced in Atlanta thereafter. I became interested in needle fear and needle pain um, really in residency. And most of my research in residency was on needle pain because I realized that we had many different mechanisms as physicians to block needle pain, but for some reason people didn't do it. So I was very interested in why caregivers chose not to address needle pain, then as I had my own children and realized that not only did needle pain make a difference for compliance, but there was a heavy fear indication and that people who became afraid of needles like my oldest son then went on to maintain that fear. So that really led to the research that I've done in the past 10 years and the interest both in buzzy and neuromodulation pain relief, but also in needle fear and vasovagal phobia. So um, I am going to give you what you need to know about needles so that you will be needle fear friendly and particularly can understand the best evidence-based methods to decrease needle fear and how that fits in with vasovagal symptoms. I've got a reception not good on voice. Anybody else having any problems with voice reception? Okay, Herman looks like, look, it's being picked. Um, and then just to reiterate uh, one question, I will not have the PowerPoint available for download 
when I give grand rounds, I do have PowerPoints as handouts, but this is a free um, webinar, so you'll get the information, but do take notes. That said, I will be having a bibliography. So all of the references that are pertinent to each slide are at the bottom. I will have a bibliography for these available afterwards. All right. Um, a couple of people who were having trouble hearing shut down other programs, plugged in speakers and it works fine, and uh, shut down another program. So it looks like overwhelmingly people are doing well. All right, so let's jump right into the state of the art, uh, patients' needles. Then the second part is going to be fear and vasovagal symptoms. And then we'll finally end up with new standards for pain relief. I think that one of the reasons I went into medicine is I like being a know-it-all. So I would like to share that joy with you. My goal is that you will know more than anyone else on your staff who didn't come to this webinar about the items below. So first, we're going to talk a lot about vasovagal symptoms prevalence, causes, and new theories and research into why more people are becoming afraid of needles. We're going to talk a little bit about difficult IV factors. You um, overwhelmingly know more about this than I do, but I'm going to share a little bit of research that may, particularly with pediatrics, help identify who the problem kids are going to be. Um, and then we're going to talk about addressing pain, fear, and focus as a model for adults, children, and anyone who is dealing with a fear of needles, because there's a multifactorial method that is the most effective when you have someone who does say they're afraid of needles. Particularly for pediatrics, we'll talk a little bit about position of comfort, and um, I'll try to emphasize things that are going to be on the quiz. So to start with, um, needle fear actually is something that has only been researched well in the last 20 years. It turns out that the fear of needles is primarily conditioned. And this means that there's usually a single event which is traumatic enough that that memory becomes associated with a fear that does not extinguish. The fear tends to continue unless someone is deconditioned and has other good experiences that drive that fear down. Now, typically, in retrospective studies, they've asked when people who are afraid of needles become afraid. And it is typically in these retrospective studies found that about age four to five is when people become conditioned to be afraid of needles. Needle procedures mean more today than they did 20 or 30 years ago. In a 2012 target survey of over 1,000 people, of those who don't get flu shots, 24% of adults said it was because they're afraid of needles. 50% of phlebotomy prescriptions, the lab draw slips, are not filled. And while those people are not questioned, an overwhelming majority of those who are say that needle fear is one of the reasons that they don't go. 51% of type 2 diabetic patients, when asked, why they delayed started insulin, cite needle fear as part of the reason they chose not to go on Victoza or insulin or injectables. And finally, of 94% of people that use insulin on a daily basis still have physiologic symptoms of fear, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, and sweating when they start to give themselves a shot. So there are more implications now than there have been in the past for people who are afraid of needles. Unfortunately, it seems that needle fear is increasing. Well, what's going on here? All right, so um, this is my favorite slide as an empathy check, because I think that all of us that are in medicine are in medicine in part because we don't mind needles. So when we see somebody that has uh, this kind of a reaction, there is some humor, but humor is typically related to pain. And so if you look at these kids, you can see that while um, a couple of them think it's really funny, a couple others are concerned for themselves as well. So let's talk about kids in needle fear. One of the reasons that, that crowds of people laugh at that picture when I'm talking is because in medicine, many of us were born before 1983. To get done with all of our training means that we tend to be a little on the older side. Before 1983, People only got between um, five and six injections before they were two years old. So you got them when you were little, you don't remember. But we assume that kids today are basically having the same experience that we do. So 
Is it bad parenting? Are they afraid of needles because they're uh, wimps? Is it because they're watching too much TV? Is it because they're not playing outside and they're not running around and they're not um, taking risks? Is it because they're snowflakes who melt at the least adversity? The reality is that if you are born after 1993, we started giving more and more vaccines and we started giving them at age four to five. So if you recall, needle fear begins at age four to five. This is how many kids, uh, how many injections a child born in 2000 received. So it's a very different landscape for kids who were born later than for the majority of people who are out in practice now um, a 40-year-old didn't have the same experience that a 14-year-old has. And if you look at the vaccine schedule, as we have added more and more, you can see that this has been a fairly steady progression since 1983. So how does this apply to phlebotomy? Well, one of the complications that we're worried about and talking about is vasovagal syncope. So in phlebotomy, when this is a lab draw at a um, at a blood draw uh, station. If this is for blood donors, it is a very different set of data than in a regular lab. The problem is that almost all of the studies I'm going to tell you about today um, of necessity were collected in controlled blood draw environments. Much of this work is done by Chris France, but this is a very um, routine, regular group of people and so it's a lot easier to do research on blood draws than it is on phlebotomy in a hospital setting, in an outpatient lab setting, or at the bedside. So um, I'll try to, to orient you to which studies these come from, but know that most of the data here has to be extrapolated to lab draws. That 50% statistic that people don't get the uh, phlebotomy prescriptions or lab draw prescriptions filled is probably because people choose not to go and those who might be inclined to faint don't even show up. So the, the data is a little skewed. Likewise, if you are going to donate blood, you've already pre-selected yourself as somebody who's willing to give blood and willing to have blood drawn out of their arm. So just those caveats. So um, that said, one of the myths um, that you see a lot is this concept that somebody who has tattoos shouldn't be afraid of having blood drawn. This is a myth because it gets at the, the real crux of vasovagal symptoms, which is that primarily vasovagal symptoms are not caused by fear. They are caused by the vagus nerve causing the body to lose blood pressure. So the vagus nerve is a um, it's called vagus because in Latin it means vagary and wandering. The vagus nerve wanders all over the body. 80% of the vagus nerve is afferent, meaning it is taking sensations from outside and bringing them into the brain. About 20% is pushing out. Now that 20% that pushes out is going to be, um, that's what lowers your blood pressure dramatically. That's what lowers your heart rate. That's what causes the parasympathetic symptoms that come. But 80% is what comes in. Now, how does this relate to blood vessels? If you look really closely, um, you can see how the vagus nerve wraps around the outside of the vessels that it's on. This is the same way in the periphery that it works. So if you are tattooing, if you're doing something that's painful just on the outer surface of the skin, you're not actually gonna stimulate the vagus in the same way as when you penetrate a vein. So first myth with vasovagal syncope is that it's fear related. Second myth is that um, the needle itself is the problem. And in general, to physiologically stimulate this response is actually the touching of the needle on the nerve, which is on the outside of the vein. So three to 5% of people have a predisposition to vasovagal symptoms. Now, the predisposition does not necessarily mean they're going to fight, to, to faint. There's actually a, um, an inventory that looks at these symptoms. And the symptoms are lightheadedness, weakness, fainting, and nausea. So when people um, have these symptoms, there's about three to 5% of the population that is more prone to these. 70% of these characteristics are inherited. So oftentimes you'll find that somebody who has a parent who's a fainter is a fainter themselves. The other thing that's interesting to note, the theory on this 
is that it's actually a warrior response. Um, women in general tend to have more vasovagal symptoms with blood draws, but the people who actually pass out, um, some studies find it to be equal, but the, the concept was that if you're a warrior and you get hit by an arrow and you pass out, all of a sudden your blood pressure drops, so you're less likely to be spurting arterial blood out, you're more likely to survive, you're more likely to go procreate another day. Um, whether that's actually the reason it happened or not, but it's kind of an interesting thing. And I tend to tell my really big patients um, who are very masculine and embarrassed about the fact that they pass out or have this, that it's, it's probably because they inherited good warrior genes. Studies have also found that age tends to impact the likelihood of having a vasovagal episode. Uh, I think as we're gonna talk about in a second, that probably that's related more to when these studies were done and how afraid of needles people are from being conditioned and having needle phobia based on their vaccine schedule. But in general, the studies find that the younger ages of people um, are more likely to have vasovagal symptoms. Now, blood pressure is also something that's a variable impact. The reason people pass out and feel bad is because they have a high blood pressure that then as the needle penetrates the vagus nerve on their, their periphery on the veins, um, the signal goes up and the blood pressure drops. So this delta between their high blood pressure and the low blood pressure is what causes the, the significance of the feeling and particularly when they do pass out. Um, this is variable in different studies for a couple of reasons. It really depends when you take the blood pressure. If your resting blood pressure is low and there's some degree of a delta, there is still more likelihood of having a, a vasovagal sim symptom. So different studies are kind of mixed on whether starting with a high blood pressure, which might imply anxiety, um, versus starting with a low blood pressure, which means you don't have far to go before you start feeling symptomatic. Um, those two things are, are more iffy. Now, gender has been correlated with a greater likelihood of vasovagal symptoms. Uh, only 1.5% of men in one study versus 3.7% of females in another study um, actually passed out. And it was definitely correlated to low weight. So all these studies are all over the board. You're going to have to take um, kind of an average to get a gestalt. But in general, it's safe to say that, that females are more likely to feel the symptoms of uh, vasovagal stimulation. Now, this is where it starts to get really interesting. So Chris France did uh, a number of really big trials looking at patients who are, are uh, high school students who are donating blood. And he asked them before they donated blood how afraid they were of having blood taken out of their arm. Then they went and they looked to see how likely they were to endorse any of those vasovagal symptoms. And what they found was that fear was strongly correlated with whether or not they then reported vasovagal symptoms. In one study, 47.9% of the people who were fearful then went on to have some degree of a vasovagal symptom, but only 20% or 18.2 had those symptoms if they were not afraid. So there's definitely a chicken and egg component here, but there, if somebody is afraid, um, that's much more suggestive of a risk factor for vasovagal symptoms. Another study that was done by France et al. found that the duration of the draw matters. Now again, this is, you know, over 10 minutes means we're talking about doing a, a blood donation and not just blood collection, but the longer it takes, the more likely they are to have vasovagal symptoms. All right, so how do you tell if someone's afraid and is it better to talk about it or not? Turns out, it's better to talk about it. So in another study, again, by the inestimable Prince France uh, from Ohio, um, he had one high school where they were donating and another high school at the same time. And he asked the, um, had everybody at one high school was asked, are you afraid of having blood drawn out of your arm? And then just, they did it on a one to five scale. They met binary of either yes or no. So any degree of yes, they counted. Um, the other school, they didn't ask. And so the, um, the interesting thing was the rate of vasovagal symptoms was not significantly different, but it was slightly non-significantly lower at the school where they asked the question. So this tells us two really important things. One is 
it doesn't cause problems if you ask somebody if they're afraid of having blood drawn out of their arm. Um, and there is a suggestion that it may possibly be beneficial to talk about it or protect it. So where do we go from this? All right, strap in because it's worth understanding this slide. And I will have um, a bibliography and I'll ask Dr. France if he minds if I include this one picture because it's really important. So this really gives a picture of what different components fit in to the likelihood that someone is going to have vasovagal symptoms and then are they gonna come back and give blood again? So let's go up here to past donation. So this just means that if somebody has donated in the past, this negative 0.195 means that they're less likely to have vasovagal symptoms. Um, they're less likely to have anxiety and they're more likely and under intention, they're more likely to want to donate again. This makes sense. If you've donated before, you're probably more likely to donate again and you're a little bit less anxious. Now let's look at anxiety. So gender contributes positively to anxiety. If you're female, you are slightly more likely to be anxious than if you're male. Now let's follow this anxiety box down. So 0.336, huge, huge impact of anxiety on how much needle pain you feel. So if you are anxious, you feel more pain, which makes sense. If you're not paying attention to pain and you're not afraid of it, you don't notice it as much. But if you're very anxious, you're going to feel more pain. But this is important because this implies to us as practitioners that if we can lower someone's anxiety, we're going to lower their perception of pain. All right, so let's keep moving. So now we've got how much um, gender impacts both anxiety, also how much it impacts needle pain. So again, females are slightly more sensitive to reporting that they feel needle pain. How does this fit into vasovagal? So needle pain has a 0.275, um, 0.275 of how many vasovagal symptoms somebody has can be explained by how much pain they have. So if we can reduce pain, we also can reduce the number of vasovagal symptoms somebody has. This treatment group here is the, where they asked about, um, are you afraid of blood being drawn out of your arm or not? So you can see it didn't really make that much difference, um, but there was some help by asking. So, um, so I think that this is, this is a complicated slide, but it's worth understanding that when you're looking at vasovagal symptoms, pain and anxiety all fit into this as part of what's gonna contribute to someone having a good experience or a bad experience. All right, so how do we address vasovagal symptoms? Um, there's a moderate amount of research on this, but again, this research is related to um, blood donation rather than phlebotomy in general. So um, one thing is to increase blood pressure. So there is um, the 0.75 to 0.89 is the confidence interval of how much reduced someone was to have vasovagal symptoms when they drank 16 ounces of water before. So small amount less likely to report symptoms, um, but some there. Applied tension. Now this is the best studied and likely the best, um, best thing you can do in your office. Now some of this is because um, people need to uh, practice and they need to learn how to do it. But some of this you can also explain to people on how to do it. So what applied tension is, is they sequentially clench their feet and their legs and their thighs and their stomach and then their upper body. If you could see my whole body, you would see how clenched and how much applied tension I'm doing. And then you hold that for 15 to 20 seconds. So what you're actually doing is physically, because you're clenching the muscles, you're physically squeezing the veins and pushing more blood up to your head, up to your chest, you're increasing preload, uh, preload and so you're getting the blood pressure up. So this means that if there's someone who already has low blood pressure, um, they're less likely to have it drop and you're bringing more blood up. So those symptoms of blood leaving your head are less likely to be pronounced. So applied tension has um, was studied in um, 
two groups and they found that people that tried applied tension, only 8% of them were likely to have symptoms compared to 16 of those who didn't. So probably one of the fastest things you can do is somebody who is a known fainter and isn't afraid is just say, hey, have you tried clenching your legs, then clenching your thighs, then clenching your stomach, clenching your arms, and getting that blood back into your core. Now, obviously, lying people down is what's recommended, and that is great. But the other thing to think about is that um, a lot of the blood pools in the legs with vasovagal syncope. So not just having them lie down, but also folding the legs and knees up is something that just from physics is going to push that blood back up into the core. Other ways you can address vasovagal symptoms are to address fear, and we'll talk extensively about that. One quick trick for pain reduction uh, was documented by Yushchenko et al., and that's asking somebody to cough right as you do the stick. So we'll talk about other pain reductions, but that's one other quick one that has been looked at for vasovagal symptoms. Um, a couple different studies have looked at things that don't work. So listening to music does not work. Um, breathing breathing um, deeply and exhaling can help. Part of the reason this probably does work, first of all, taking deep breaths and then slowly letting it out is something that takes concentration. So does applied tension and concentration is a distraction. So that helps. But the other thing is that when you take a deep breath, um, taking the deep breath and then letting it out, as you let it out, you increase preload. So you get more blood again um, to decrease and blunt that effect of vasovagal. One final thing, so the, the, there are two different groups of people and in multiple different studies from childhood through adult, uh, you have about 20 to 27% of people that are going to want to watch. They're either attenders or control. Um, then you have people that do not want to watch and those are avoiders. The thing is, even in the people who are avoiders who don't want to watch, 100% of them are gonna check in at some point. So you don't want to physically restrain someone from being able to watch the blood draw. People's coping styles are dictating what works better for them. Um, so if they're the 20% that wanna watch, let them watch. If they're not, they're not. All right, finally, there are two different studies that have looked, um, one of them is more for people who have cardiac arrhythmias, looking at vasovagal syncope and fluoxetine, which is, um, an SSRI, it's an antidepressant. Paxil, I think, is the generic or is the, the brand name. But fluoxetine was checked for those groups. Um, caffeine, they did do a blood draw caffeine test and they gave people either 50 milligrams, 125 milligrams, or 250. Um, 250 is like two and a half cups of Starbucks. That's pretty big time caffeine. So getting caffeine beforehand did help, but only at the really high doses. So telling somebody to have a cup of coffee beforehand is probably not gonna be sufficient. Um, however, if there's someone who routinely has a history of passing out and seizing, then it may not be a bad plan. All right, so here is the schematic. Um, and I'll go ahead and I'll put this schematic in my packet with the, uh, with the um, bibliography, because I think this is really important too. Um, this is how I believe the best evidence supports addressing patients when they come in, is asking, are you afraid of having blood drawn out of their arm? And if they say yes, then ask what their history is. Um, when I was uh, practicing pediatric emergency medicine and doing a lot of spinal taps, when I had to do a lumbar puncture on a neonate, I would ask the mom, so did you get an epidural? And if they did, I'd say, okay, how was that for you? And if they said, oh, fine, then I said, okay, this is exactly like that. If the mom said, oh, the epidural was terrible, it was the worst thing ever, then I say, okay, the spinal tap is nothing like that. Um, and then I explain exactly the same way how it happens. But knowing the history is really important when you're addressing someone who has a fear of needles. So when you find out what it was that happened, then you can very easily say, Oh, really? I understand. That makes sense. I would be afraid of needles if that happened too. This is going to be totally different. Now, when you have a fainter, a really critical part is to ask them what helps. Because in general, people who have fainted in the past or people who get severe vasovagal symptoms know things that work for them. So ask them first what helps. 
And I will tell you, the thing that helps um, 90% of the people who come to me, because now I see all the bottom of the iceberg of needle fear people, the thing that seems to help the most for most of them is to not be told, um, okay, you're going to feel a stick or ready or here we go. None of that. Um, they usually prefer to distract themselves. They have a way that they want it to go down. And um, so long as you are not breaking any, um, any rules or going against guidelines, there's no reason not to do what they say. And most of the time, what they're going to want is just, um, I'm going to look over here. I'm going to pay attention to this. Don't tell me when it's coming. I'm just going to pay attention over here. You can certainly um, suggest to them that they raise a knee up or lay them down if they have a history of that in the past. But listening to the patient um, and trying to steal yourself not to warn them because we're all trained to do it. Here you go, you're gonna feel this now. For these particular patients, it's better not to warn them. If they don't have something that has worked for them in the past, if they say, no, it's always bad, then give them a few options and talk to them about the things and tricks we're going to discuss. So, um, if they are afraid and you ask them if there's any bad experiences they've had in the past and they say, no, not really. I just don't like getting blood drawn or who would like getting blood drawn or everybody hates needles. If those are some of the answers, then that's when you say, all right, that's cool. We have some solutions and things that make it much better than in the past. There's some really cool new things you can try. And all of these things are gonna break down to the next half of the lecture, which is dealing with pain, fear, and focus. By the way, somebody just said they have teenagers use iPod distraction. Um, in general, not even in general, all of these different research modalities that have um, looked at things like music, they randomize people. And so people are randomly attributed to either do a music or do um, a distraction or do, you know, drink water. So it's very different when someone is randomized to a condition. Those studies aren't going to, um, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't dissuade you from letting somebody do what works for them. Because as we'll discuss, a big part of fear is control. So if somebody has fear of needles and they have a mechanism that works for them, then that control that they get from listening to their iPod or from doing whatever they do, um, that's gonna have a lot more validity than published research because published research can help people who don't have an idea of what to do but um, for people who have a plan again let them go with their plan all right so so the construct of distress with medical procedures is that it's not just the pain it is actually a venn diagram with pain fear and focus all on top of each other and the experience that comes out of this pain fear and focus leaves them with a memory. And so when you have a bad memory and a fear, it takes about three times to decondition that bad memory to come to a neutral place in fear. So how do we address this? Well, let's look at the elements of fear. So what causes fear um, in any situation, not just medical? First of all is history. I mean, we are creatures who learn how to predict um, pain and negativity in situations. So when we have a bad history, that's the biggest predictor of fear. The next thing that causes fear is when we don't know what a situation is going to contain. So to the extent that we can mitigate that, um, the unknown aspects, those help fear. Obviously, the unexpected is something, um, anybody who jumps out from behind something or touches you or wakes you up when you don't expect it, anything that's underneath the, uh, the lake, um, the unexpected is also something. So you want to move as calmly and not uh, chaotically when approaching patients. I see this all the time with new residents that are going to be sewing people up in the emergency room. They wanna show how cool they are. And so they wanna set things up really quickly, but in setting things up and having trays moving and things clinking, what they've done is they give a person a sense um, that they don't know what's expected and they don't know what's coming. So lack of chaos and calm voices. I think every phlebotomist I've ever worked with have, has the calmest voice and it's something that you just absorb. So avoiding the unexpected helps with fear. Now, particularly for us and with children, um, lack of control and language matter. And 
it's not just pediatric. Being able to give the person the control to look or look away, um, giving them the control of whether they want to sit in this position or that position, to the extent we can offer choices, that's something that helps reduce fear. All right, so let's talk about history. Um, this alludes to what I talked about earlier, but if you think about history, knowing the age of the patient is really important because this um, may be a little hard to see, but in um, 1900 to 1920, all the way up to 1980, you only got six shots. And then we started escalating like this. So the older children who are out there now, millennials, um, people that are in their early 20s, this is their fear. What I did was um, I got all of these blue numbers by going through the CDC records and looking at how many vaccines were given by year. And then I looked at every study I could find that gave a percentage of fear of needles. And I plotted that by birth year. So for example, these two studies here in 1980, one of these studies was published in 1995. And when it was done, the patients who were in that study were 10 years old. Another one of these studies was published in 2001. But if you go and look at the birth year, their percentage of needle fear was actually the same. So this um, is being presented in March at a conference. But again, this just shows that, that we have a very different group of people that are approaching our healthcare system. Over the next 10 years, we're gonna have people who are born in 1980 and uh, beyond being our primary patients. So dealing with needle fear is something that's gonna become a lot more prevalent, not less, until we start giving fewer um, vaccines at the same time on those four to six year old age ranges where we get micro needles or something that doesn't hurt. All right, so what are coping um, behaviors? What kinds of things help uh, in an environment. So things that have been shown to reduce distress and reduce fear are humor, non-procedural talk, you know, tell me about your job, tell me about your school. And then if someone starts to lose it, what's actually been found to be effective is commands to use coping strategies. So being directive and say, hey, you look like you're getting a little nervous. I need you to do this for me. I need you to look at that for me. I need you to do this strategy and then giving them a concrete thing, those actually reduce distress because it makes someone realize that there is someone who is in control and who knows what they're doing in the situation. Um, again, giving choices to the extent they can be given. Obviously, you can't tell them the choice of the lab draw tubes, um, but, but giving them a choice of would you rather look away or would you rather look here? Um, do you have music you wanna listen to? Things like that. So giving choices is something that's helpful. Now, what has been researched and found to not be helpful? Things that undermine um, a patient's anxiety, things that cause more distress are actually empathy. Now, this is particularly um, in studies that are done with 18 and younger. So this particular thing I cannot say for older patients, but when you give empathy, like, I know, it's okay, honey, I'm sorry. Um, apologizing and empathy actually make distress worse for children. Much better to be matter of fact. Obviously, criticism um, for anybody is not helpful, but reassurance is not something that decreases distress. I think this is the hardest one for me to practice, uh, to put into practice. Our nature is to reassure younger patients and children, and the best is um, to decrease. We're going to talk about getting past the anticipation um, to make the coping better, but don't be reassuring. And and uh, obviously don't give them control. Never ever fall prey to the, I need to go to the bathroom trick. It's like, this is gonna take two minutes. You can go to the bathroom then. Now, another thing that increases distress is dishonesty. So everybody always wants to know, well, you know, how do you answer the question, is this gonna hurt? I'm not gonna read that one. You can all read it. But, um, but honesty is critical. But you don't have to say, this is going to hurt like hell. What you need to say um, is choose words that have been proven to be less distressing rather than more distressing. So you don't even respond with, um, it might hurt a little or it's going to hurt. What actually is, decreases distress and makes kids less anxious is using words like bother. Things like, um, you know, a lot of kids aren't that bothered. 
or we have a lot of people that are worried that come in, so you're validating their emotional response, but we've got these new tricks that make things so much more comfortable. So use words like bother, comfort. Um, when you're preparing someone, showing them a straw rather than a needle, and they've done studies looking to see whether pain is reduced using the word ready to alert someone that there's going to be uh, the poke versus um, you're gonna feel a sharp scratch. Neither one of those actually made any difference. But sharp scratch is not a good word. Squeeze, pushing, pressure. Here comes a little pressure. Those things are okay if you're going to be alerting them to what's next. So pinch is also bad because a kid who is looking, um, is thinking about pinch um, or a little burn, these are both very bad sensations. And so it's much better to say pressure. Um, it's much better to say, you know, the, we're getting started if you're going to alert them to it, um, but not using a word like pinch, poke, or burn. It's much better to say pressure, bother, okay, here comes, you're gonna feel something now. Using words like straw or using words um, uh, like a rubber band for a tourniquet, those are called medical reinterpretation. One of the biggest sources of fear for patients who are not used to medical environments is seeing things that are um, distressing. So one of the studies that was done found that one of the most helpful ways to decrease fear and distress is to use medical reinterpretation. So instead of this being a tray with hoses and nitrous oxide, a medical reinterpretation would be, oh, this is a tray that has some water and it's got some things that suck up like an elephant's nose. So medical reinterpretation for younger kids, exactly what child life does, saying this is a straw rather than saying this is my IV cannula. Now clearly one of the things that makes people more afraid is being out of control and you're never less in control than if you're strapped down to a papoose board. So the, the um, I lecture all over the country, almost exclusively in children's hospitals, and papoose boards I have only seen in one hospital in the last three years. These are really going the way of the dinosaur. When you have someone who is getting phlebotomy, the, the newest thing that's being used is position of comfort. So um, position of comfort, um, this is the concept that the parent if they are asked and told um, and agree, the parent can provide some of the secureness that you need for a child to not move. So what are the steps with this? Well, the first step is to let the parent know, hey, um, a lot of our kids feel more comfortable and secure if they're being held, but you need to be able to be secure when we're ready to do the procedure. Do you feel like you can do that and would you like to? So when you're doing position of comfort, it's really important to be very clear and directive and use words secure. Secure in this place has two meanings, because you're not only going to make the child feel secure emotionally, the parent helps secure the extremity. The idea is to have the joint above and below where the blood draw is gonna be done secured. So if you're doing an antecubital draw, you're gonna to wanna to secure above and below. Get the affirmation and be secure. Um, Side sitting position, the problem with this is I actually would want to have the person's arm on the gurney with the dad's hand on top of it because right now the child can move the shoulder, it's not secure. If they're gonna do it, you wanna have them put the hand on top. All right, so addressed fear, I'd like to briefly go through pain. So when you're looking at a pediatric patient, there are ways to determine whether or not someone is more likely to be a difficult stick. Um, just to keep in mind, uh, not to memorize this, but prematurity and age less than a year are by far the things that contribute the most. Now, adult patients um, are a different matter. And the thing to know about them is that when you ask if they're afraid of needles, many of them also are gonna be concerned about pain. And so if you don't have any um, creams or other options, that's fine, but it's something that after the stick, if they have a problem with it or complain, you can let them know that there are other options that are available for next time. Now to start talking about pain, I just wanna say right out here, um, many patients will say, oh, I'm a difficult stick or I don't wanna have this, um, you need to do a butterfly for me. The reality is there's very, very little good data that supports um, butterflies from a pain management standpoint. 
So if someone says it hurts more, um, there are a couple different things you can say. One is that butterflies may be better than a cannula, an IV cannula in terms of hemolysis. It's really not going to help with pain. Um, likewise, looking at success, the literature is very scant. This one study did show um, when they switched over to all butterflies that the severe nerve injuries from needles did drop. So this is between 2006, they had 1.23 significant injuries. They switched to all butterfly, it went down. Um, I don't think this is something that you need to end up discussing with your patients. The things for your point of view is that, that butterflies do not decrease pain. The only times butterflies help is if you're looking at trying not to hemolyze, and all of those studies are done in emergency rooms where they're comparing it to starting an IV. So it's not phlebotomy, it's really cannulation to start an IV. All right, so um, let's go down alphabetically and talk quickly about pain options. A methacane gel, Buzzy, um, cold spray, Emla, JTIP, lidocaine blub, Elamax, Samara, Sanera. I'm not gonna have time to talk about most of these, just really briefly. So from a time comparison, the one that costs the most time is Emla. To be truly effective, Emla needs to be in place for 30, uh, for, sorry, for 60 minutes. Elamax for pain management needs to be in place for 30. Um, on average, the studies find that when you're using Elamax, Elamax, it takes 40 minutes from putting it on to finishing to do a draw. Sanera is a, um, Emla stands for eutectic mixture of local anesthetics. And it's 2.5% prilocaine and 2.5% lidocaine mixed together in a, um, a slurry. The one contraindication with EMLA uh, is that patients who are very atopic, about 2% of them can have a petechial rash. You don't need to get coags. You don't need to go back. That's a well-described phenomenon with EMLA. Um, but it's, it's not something that I wouldn't use it for somebody who is allergic or atopic. Just know that that can happen. All right, so back to time. Cold spray. Um, 3.6 minutes and buzzy 3.5. So the cold spray and buzzy, that's basically looking at studies that have been done from start to finish. How fast does it work? Um, one thing to know about EMLA is that the EMLA and Elamax rely on it being absorbed through the skin. And while Elamax has not been studied in this particular, um, in, in this particular uh, construct, it's probably the same type deal. It's gonna work less well for darker skinned people because they have thicker stratum corneum. It's harder for that to get absorbed through the skin. The other thing about EMLA is that it will vasoconstrict for the first hour. There's no difference in success when it's left on for an hour um, and a half or more, but we looked at EMLA in, uh, when I was at UT Southwestern. So we looked at it and saw how much the first stick success was based on how long it had been on. What we found was that when Emla is on for two to three hours, we had almost a 90% success rate. The problem is that when it was only on for less than an hour, that success rate actually dropped to 35% through the Emla site. Um, when they picked another site, it still was only about 55%. So Emla will vasoconstrict for that first half an hour, 45 minutes, then it starts getting back to normal, then it starts enlarging again. So if you can't use Emla for an hour, do not use it. Um, and interestingly, if you are going to use either Elamax or, or uh, Emla, um, most children find the pain from removing the tegaderm. So uh, there is another option that we use a lot with our oncology kids, which is Glad Press and Seal. We put it on when they're getting a spinal tap with Emla because the Glad Press and Seal peels right off the skin without any problems. You have to use a really big piece of it, but, um, but it peels off with no pain. All right. Um, other options, JTIP has a very loud popping sound. It's extremely effective. It costs about $6 per use. Um, and if you look at it, how much it costs to get pain relief down, it's about $23 to get a pain score of less than four. Because in children, obviously, there's a lot more going on than just pain. Looking and comparing costs between all of the different options. Um, if you looked at 400 uses, this is what it is. Now, I did not include Sonera. Sonera is $20 per use. It is a 7% tetracaine patch. Um, you crack it, it gets very warm and you put it on. It's great for a really difficult stick, um, amazing success rates in putting it on, um, anywhere between 96 and 100%, depending on the study. Problem with Sonera is it's 20 bucks a pop. 
it also is very stiff. So when you put it on, you really need to secure it with something else. Some children, it's going to be too painful. So let's talk in my last five minutes about neuromodulation. So neuromodulation is using the body's nerves to block the sensation of pain. Um, if you look here at this A delta fiber, this is the pain nerve. And the pain nerve runs alongside a very small C fiber, which is cold, and then a really fat, chunky A beta fiber. So the A beta fiber is, nerve, is uh, motion. If you bang your hand with a hammer, you shake it and it feels better. If you um, use vibration, you're exhibiting that same kind of A beta stimulation. And what happens is all of these sensations come together into the dorsal horn of the spinal column with one piece of information sent to the brain. So if you get enough cold, enough motion, you don't transmit pain. Best example is a burn. Burn your finger, stick it under cold water, you don't feel it. To give an even more of a, a breakdown, if you look at this, in this one, the green is the pain. So um, the pain has different parts of the dorsal column. Some are blunted by vibration, some of them are blunted by cold. So if you put cold and vibration together, you ought to be able to block pain. Sure enough, you do. Um, looking just at cold spray, the problem with cold spray is that it goes down to about negative 17 degrees. On children, it's going to cause more pain because it is so cold. There was a recent uh, meta-analysis by Hogan et al, and their recommendation from looking at the studies uh, is that cold spray should not be used for children at all. And they actually recommend not using it for adults because there are almost equivalent number of people that are adults that get more pain rather than those that get pain relief. So cold spray is using those C fibers, but you need to only have the cold be the regular freezing temperature, not something that's sub zero. So Buzzy is an elastic um, strap that holds an ice pack with cold with vibration on top of it. You put it proximally between the brain and the pain. At this point, a quarter million people have used this for needle pain. And by stimulating those A beta um, and C fibers, you block out the sharp A delta pain. So people are going to just hold it on proximally. You can put it under the tourniquet, but it needs to be in the same dermatome to block the pain to immediately blow it. Uh, two studies have been done now that find it equivalent to Elamax. One of them by Bohorsky et al. did not use the ice packs. The other one by Potts et al. from CHOP did use the ice packs. Ice is going to give adults about 60% more numbing. With children, um, it can be more equivocal, just like cold spray. So the, the studies are more mixed. We recommend using the ice packs when children are four and up and letting them decide between age two and four whether they want to use it. All right. Um, whew. All right. So one of the most interesting things, though, about vibration is that vibration appears to um, basically dilate. And so we first looked at buzzy versus cold spray. Now, mind you, cold spray is going to vasoconstrict, so it wasn't a totally fair study in that way. Um, but cold spray was what my little used, so we were kind of stuck with that, no pun intended. And what we found was that the first stick success was three times higher using Buzzy than it was using um, cold spray. So some of this, I think, is probably because cold spray did some vasoconstriction, but some, and it seems to be that the vibration vasodilates. Chop did a study and found Buzzy to be equivalent with LMAX, but they did not use um, first stick success as one of their outcomes. That study is in uh, press, so all I have is the, the poster. There may be more details when it comes out and it's published. Um, there have been a couple studies other though that have found that 81% of phlebotomists found it easier to get the stick with Buzzy than without. And I think, again, what we're looking at here is just the fact that the vibration does cause vasodilation. Here's the pain relief that was shown by it. So to use Buzzy, just because a lot of people aren't familiar with it, you're going to just attach it with a tourniquet or under a tourniquet where you would normally put a tourniquet. Um, you don't put it directly on the site. Just put it where the tourniquet goes. Patients can also hold it themselves, like this little guy. And um, then you just clean normally. You don't need to wait any time. Just clean and do it normally. And then to clean it, use a standing wipe afterwards. This study was done in New Zealand, um, looking at Buzzy for injections. I think though that it's really important to underscore that the, the fear of needles was reduced after the uses in a non-adherent group. So you're not gonna get good results um, in somebody who's anxious trying any of these things the first time. The point is to try to decrease it over time. All right, so finally just talk quickly about focus and then take your questions. 
what has been found to work best as a distraction is an active visual rote distraction. So it's got to be a behavior the person knows how to do, like um, blowing up a balloon. It has to be some degree of counting, where there's rote. So um, how many monkeys do you see? Somebody put in the comments that they have a brightly colored poster. That's perfect. And what's really good is if you find something for them to, to find. So um, it's not just look at this colorful, cute thing. It's can you find two monkeys who have eyeglasses? Um, how many monkeys have different numbers of fingers? So, so doing a Where's Waldo doesn't work because it takes too much time and is too difficult, but quick finding things um, are important. If you have a fish tank, where can you find the yellow and gold stripes? If you have a picture on the wall of fish, how many guppies are there? So um, those kinds of rote counting questions are really good. We make the distraction cards and um, they have been studied in three different studies now and they work better than a kaleidoscope, they work better than videos, but again, these distraction cards have an active component. The questions are on the back. So it's just like child life, engaging the child, um, even an adult, having them do a difficult task makes it more effective. All right, these are just a couple um, vasovagal things. I'm very interested. I put this in because thus far, no one has studied buzzy for vasovagal syncope, but it makes sense that if you don't feel the nerve, if you don't feel the needle on the vagus nerve, you don't have the same symptoms. And we have had a lot of anecdotal support for people saying, I didn't pass out, I've always passed out. So if anyone's interested in researching this, please contact me offline because I think it'd be a fascinating study. So in summary, um, needle fear has dramatically changed in the last two decades. We have a completely different landscape and criticism and um, judging our patients doesn't help them. If our goal is for them to have positive experiences to come back into the medical system and even more to come back into our place of business and not freak out if they're coming to our emergency room again, we need to address the needle fear with respect and realize that in many ways, our current safety net with vaccination um, has helped to cause this. So if we can reduce the fear and get kids into adulthood without fear, that should be part of our goal. Furthermore, our goal should be to do no harm. So if we are causing them to go forward with a bad fear of coming back into the healthcare system, um, we're really undermining what healthcare is supposed to be about. And fortunately, there are many different ways on a very fast basis to address the uh, syncope, if we can reduce anxiety, if we can reduce pain, then we can reduce the symptoms and the negative experiences associated with vagovagal syncope. Um, thank you very much for your time. And I will now look down here and take the questions that you haven't been answering for each other. Thank you very much, Patricia, for your kind words. Okay, so um, the question is, am I advocating topical anesthetics for venipunctures in addition to vaccinations? Um, and have validation studies been conducted to determine if prolonged vasoconstriction during phlebotomy affects lab values? Um, so there have been a number of studies that have been done looking at prolonged tourniquet application to see if it affects lab values. And the maximal lab value derangement um, is between two and three minutes of tourniquet application prior to getting started. So if you leave the tourniquet on for several minutes and then get started, yes, that does derange lab values. Um, Buzzy and tourniquets are the same, um, and a study actually found the same differences based on, you know, just like a tourniquet. Um, and as far as vaccinations, I, I really don't think it's practical to do topical anesthetics for all vaccinations. I think we need to work on non-pharmacologic measures that can reduce fear. And the more we can incorporate distraction, the more we can decrease fear, use um, positions of comfort, and certainly there are some groups, the older kids get it, the better buzzy works for vaccinations, but it doesn't work well when you're getting three or four shots as a three-year-old. I mean, it's, it's um, we need to do that better. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and the, the derangement that's most frequent if you have prolonged uh, time. The, there actually are two studies that are on our site that talk about the prolonged tourniquet application, but yeah, potassium, is obviously a derangement. Um, cold is something else. You don't want to put, the, one of the reasons you don't want to put the ice pack from Buzzy directly on 
is because you can get cold agglutinins. So you want to put it proximal. Warm blood is flowing toward it. So you're not going to get um, vasoconstriction. You're also not going to get that um, here. So like this, like this guy, you know, you don't want to put it directly where you're going to be sticking because you can change, you can clump white blood cells when you have uh, cold applied directly on the site. Sorry about your uh, earthquakes in New Zealand. Monique, I'm sorry, the, because I do this as grand rounds, I don't want all of my slides being out there for everybody, but I will put the information and the uh, bibliography up. You're always welcome to invite me for grand rounds, but I don't give handouts um, for this talk for wide dissemination. All right, and I have one more minute. Anybody else got a question? And, um, oh, moderator Dave, thank you. And if you have one question that's come up that I should pop up, let me know. One person asked about sample buzzies. We don't sample buzzy because you can reuse it thousands of times. Um, and so there's not really a mechanism where we could stay in business if we gave everybody a free one because you can just keep reusing it. That's why it's so inexpensive is because if you amortize it over time, you just clean it between patients and reuse it over and over again. Um, $69.95 for the bigger, for the smaller buzzy, which is more for injections, and $99.95 is a cost for the phlebotomy buzzy. This one right here in the middle is the mini. That's the 69 one, and then this bigger one here, even though he doesn't have a strap in, that's the bigger one for uh, the 99. You disinfect Buzzy by using um, Sani wipes, and so you just wipe it down the same way that you would a blood pressure cuff. So just wipe the, um, wipe the outside of it. We also do have infection control bags, so you can buy infection control bags for that. Um, Buzzy UK, Buzzy.UK. So if you're in the United Kingdom, um, buzzyforshots.uk it has it and they should have just gotten a new shipment i know they were sold out for a while thank you annabeth how did shark tank turn out um i really i went on shark tank and i wanted to raise awareness of needle phobia and they cut all of that so i mean that, that was my number one goal was to raise awareness of needle phobia uh but they did what offer me money but at the time we really didn't need it and so um so i didn't take it but it was totally Anxiety provoking, but fun. Buzzy is shipped to every country except for Canada. Um, oh, thanks, Rebecca. I'm glad you love the Buzzy. Uh, distraction cards are also on the buzzyhelps.com website. Let's see, I could tell so. Um, the Shark Tank thing was also interesting because they really wanted me to say stuff like eliminates pain. So this is the this is the bibliography that's just the buzzy research, and you can find all of these studies on buzzy help buzzy help slash for slash clinical trials. So whenever I hear about a new trial, I put it up there. There are a couple that are being done now in Canada. I know we can't sell in Canada. Somehow they got them, um, but there's some interesting ones. Still looking at buzzy for Botox uh, for kids with cerebral palsy, and um, using it for uh, Humira injections. The ice packs are reusable. You can get um, CHOP, Children's Healthcare of Philadelphia uses disposable ice packs, but um, everybody else in the world uses reusable ones. Not everybody, but mostly people use reusable. So Rebecca, we have um, bags now. The the cleanly, the your, your, your lab has banned them for uh, cleanliness. So no, most places aren't worried about that because it's the same procedure as a uh, blood pressure cuff. But for those that are, we do have um, new, introduced a couple months ago, uh, infection control bags. And they're very cheap and you can buy the infection control bag and it actually fits the ice and the buzzy really well into the same place. Um, yes, we're gonna have this back on, so we're gonna have this up on Monday. Yeah, I can see the disposable blood pressure cuffs, except for in our hospital, people don't send, they don't seem to dispose of them. But um, the infection control bags will work because those keep it snug and you can just use a different one for each one.
So you'll have 24 hours to do the exam. You don't need to do it right this second. Um, and actually, you know what, I'm, I have no problems leaving it open for uh, 48 hours. So we'll go ahead and do that. And moderator, if you can verify that we can do that. And you freeze the ice pack by putting them in a freezer. That's part of the biggest pain is you've got to actually, the thing is if you try to use those crack pack things, it absorbs the vibration. So then it undermines it and doesn't work. Um, so Dawn, you can do it within 48 hours, but we are going to close it down after that. And then we're going to put it up on a um, fee for certification thing. Thank you, O moderator, for giving us an extra 24 hours. Thank you, Julie. Glad you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you, Kristen. You're welcome, Hannah. Oh, Dennis Erds. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Cynthia. It's weird talking to a, a camera and not an audience full of people. I'm going to stay on till uh, 2.15 if there are any other questions. So you got six more minutes of freebie questions. Yeah, Chris, it's, it's hard and it's getting harder. And I think the thing is, it, it, we lose, you know, we just get frustrated because, you know, when every kid and every patient is coming in and super anxious, it's good to have something quick. I, that's one of the reasons I really like Chris Franks' work, just to be able to say, um, you know, are you afraid of having blood drawn out of your arm? Then you can cut right to the chase and get right to productive things that'll uh, solve the problems. Ooh, Megan, I wish LabCorp would make it mandatory too. Talk to them. Quest Diagnostics actually does have um, Buzzy, but they call it Quiggles, but same thing. Oh, so this is a good question. Um, so uh do 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 um the question of what do you what do you say to parents that constantly give control to the child um so what i when i when the parents basically are saying something that's not helpful the first thing i do is they say hey mom i love how involved you are and um in making this go well what we find really work well is if the parents um play games with the child while this is going on can, and, and I mean, I have the distraction cards, so I give them the distraction cards, but I say, why don't you guys play this game while I do this? And if they still do it, I say, um, hey, mom, you're doing a really good job of parenting. However, my job is getting the blood drawn and I can tell you um, the things that seem to work better are for, for your child to know that I'm really good at what I do. So um, I'm gonna do this part of it and you guys, uh, what would you like to do? Would you like to play a game? Would you like to watch the TV? So give them some choices, but make it clear that you're the expert and you're in control. Um, and I, you know, rarely I ask the parent to step out, but, it, and I have said before, um, you know, mom, I've done this a lot and your child seems very mature and you're used to them having a lot of control, but right now this is going to make them more anxious. Um, let me do it this way, or I'll actually need to ask you to step out of the room. So you give them a, you know, a graded sequential, um, you know, compliment their little snowflake first, but let them know that you're in control and you're going to do it. So you need 70% to pass, uh, Nancy Shaw. Um, you can take the test over and over again. So if you get it wrong the first time, then, um, That'll be an issue, but I, I do, it would be nice to be able to study it to figure it out. I'm not sure how to address that. Email us offline at info at mmjlabs dot, or actually at the webinar address, and um, if it's too hard, because I made it a hard test. I mean, it's, you know, you're going to get certified. You ought to really know stuff, so. Um, webinars in Spanish. Reynaldo, we do have a, a Buzzy in Mexico. I usually do lectures there on pain management um, 
at uh, Hospital Español once a year. Um, they're simulcast, porque uh, yo hablo poco español. But we do have the, the Buzzy is in Mexico and we do have a distributor there. Um, Kimberly Brown just emailed me at info at mmjlabs.com. MMJ stands for Max, Miles, and Jill. Yeah, Nancy, there's a lot of information in there. And I talk really quickly, so sorry about that. Thank you, Renato. All right, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm scrolling through here to see if I missed anything. Oh, 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 Marianne Merritt, are you still on? Autistic patients, yeah, I have a really good suggestion. And um, it is buzzy by itself with no ice. Let them hold it against their chest like this and just turn it off and on. They love it. I don't know why. There's something about the vibration and the control, the locus of control. Um, they use it for all of their autistic patients at University of Arkansas. And they're starting to use it for all the patients, but they use Buzzy for everybody. And a lot of them just let the kids hold it themselves. And it's so distracting for the autistic kids. Um, they, especially the, some of the ones that are, are verbal, like this one kid, um, they had Buzzy stickers and he didn't want anything from the toy box. He just wanted to have a Buzzy sticker. There's something about it that autistic kids just really, um, I, I'm sure somebody must have freaked out with it, but that I've not heard that there's something about the vibration or the frequency that they really dig. That's another good study that nobody's done, but um, the, the folks at University of Arkansas have um, told me that they just, that they've got it now in all of their areas of the hospital, particularly for autistic kids. The ice packs are frozen. They're not refrigerated, unfortunately. So, um, so when the ice packs go on, they're 17 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so they're below freezing and then they rise up to 30 to 35 in about 60 seconds. And so the optimal pain relief is someplace between 25 and 30. You want it to be a little bit below freezing, but not too much. So cold sprays like negative 20, negative 17, um, you definitely want it to be in the 15 Fahrenheit or higher. But it's also interesting, Marianne, because um, cold does something called descending noxious inhibitory control. So it's not just local cold, but like when you put your hand in a bucket of ice water, that cold stimulation um, causes your brain to, to dampen down all pain. So it has to be a noxious thing. It has to be something that's, that's right on the edge there to get the feedback loop pain relief in addition to the gate control pain relief. Oh, good call, Laurie. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you all for joining in, and I'll uh, get to work getting that bibliography available for you.